Praise team, thank you for that. I was like, Jamil, I never asked, what's going to be your major? Accounting. Amen. All right. Amen. So I should have asked that earlier, but amen. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, let it be your words, not my words, Lord. You, Lord, are the molder. I am the clay, Lord. Mold me and shape me. Let it be your words, not mine, Lord. And let us hear what you have to say to us today. Amen? Amen. And accounting. Well, Jamil, let me tell you how it's going to go. You're going to go to college. You'll probably get on the dean's list. You'll graduate with honors. Then you can come home, get on your Xbox, and chill for the next four or five years. Now, I just met you today. I just met your mother. It ain't gonna happen that way, I'll tell you right now. She's gonna tell you to get a job, a J-O-B. And what was that song that the ladies used to sing? Ain't nothing going on but the rent. You better have a J-O-B if you want to be with me. You these women, all right now, all right now. Uh-huh. Preach, preach. So well, the topic of the sermon is getting a new job. From the scriptures we just read, we read about Jesus getting fishermen. Now, do any of you all go fishing here? Well, a few of you all go fishing. I know C does fishing. Well, I do fishing also. When I go fishing, I got my two water holes, Kroger and Publix. <laughs> Being a city kid, I don't know much about fishing. So they took me out fishing one day. And they gave me, I had a fishing pole that I bought for 1995. <laughs> to me, that was expensive because I'm not, I'm not sure I don't like this kind of work. Well, we get to the fishing hole, and they say, well, take this worm and put it on the hook. So I took the worm, I laid it on the hook, <laughs> threw it out, and the worm was still there. This worm doesn't want to be agreeable, so I tried again. Worm's still there. And the guy says, no, you got to impale the worm on the hook. What did this worm do to me? Well, we decided to do that. And I said, I'm not happy with that. So they took a piece of bread and put on there and started fishing. Now, there's two things I realized. One, a lot of people that go fishing, they're kind of crazy. Here's why. We go out and say, look, we're going to eat good, we're going to get some catfish, we're going to cook it up. So what they did, they went to my Warren hole, Kroger, and brought back some chicken fillets. Perfect, organic, beautiful piece of chicken. And they cut it up, put it on the hook, threw it out there to get some catfish so they can eat. Fishermen are crazy. We had the chicken right there. I mean, this chicken has just committed suicide. They said, 
we're going to kill ourselves just for you to eat. But no, we're going to cut it up and throw it in the water. So fishing we do now for recreation. But back then, fishing was a job. That was a job. You went to work. What kind of men were these that Jesus was talking to? And there's a couple things we could tell about these men right away. One, they were not rich men. They were, they were poor men. They didn't have a whole lot of money. Because look at the job they were doing. Had they had an education, they probably would be doing something else. But they could only, they, the job they only could do was fishermen. That was their life. And fishermen is not an easy job. Now, when you're doing it for recreation, you're having fun, you're relaxing, you may take a drink or two, whatever, but that was for us here. For them, it's life or death. If you don't catch no fish, you don't eat no fish. You can't get paid. So this kind of work was very demanding work. Casting nets, sometimes getting some fish, sometimes not. And sometimes you're getting discouraged. Why? Because you caught nothing. Imagine working eight hours a day, 10 hours a day, 12 hours a day, and coming home with nothing. That's what these guys had to deal with from time to time. They came home with nothing. They worked all day, worked hard, worked smart, and didn't come home with much at all. And sometimes they came home with a lot. That was the job of a fisherman. So it's a kind of job where, yes, you can get discouraged easily. For all of us who want to do something and show something for our work. We don't want to just be working just to be working and not get paid. Could you imagine you went to your job and say, we need to work 10 hours a day, but we're not going to pay you. What would be the next two words out of your mouth? Bye-bye. That kind of work is not work for everyone. You have to have a certain determination, a certain will that you are going to succeed. And even in the most worst cases, dealing with storms, dealing with other people, you're going to get that job done. So these are hardworking men. They weren't smart men. They weren't geniuses. They weren't rich men. But they were determined men. They were men about to get the business done. And Jesus called these two men first to start his disciples. So why would you choose these two men? They're not powerful men. They're not learned men. But if you notice, in the Bible, God usually calls those who are not the best. They're not the strongest. They're not the smartest. They're not the prettiest. They have issues. They have some trouble. But he calls on them. And he calls on these fishermen, and I believe he called on these fishermen because these men here can deal with someone saying no. For as we are building the, Christ, we're building the kingdom of God, as we are bringing others to Christ, sometimes we're going to hear a no. Sometimes you can hear some things you don't want to hear. People will be against you. People are not going to like you. People are going to, to disown you for lack of a better term, they want to get rid of you. Why? Because you're preaching the good news. So you have to be strong. You cannot be weak. You have to be powerful. But you have to also be humble. But you also have to learn how to take rejection. And rejection is going to happen. So if a fisherman who was fishing all day and gets nothing knows tomorrow's going to be a better day. And they get their nets ready, and they go out tomorrow. And tomorrow may be a bad day. And they say, well, the next day is going to be a better day. And they get their nets ready again, and they go out again and have another bad day. Well, you know what? The next day is going to be a good day. And that may go on for a while. But it's a simple fact of they're going to keep being persistent, keep asking, keep going. And as a job of the, as a Christian is that we have to keep going. Now, I know some of y'all are retired. If you're retired, raise your hand. That's why right, you got no more job, right? 
Job's over. You don't have to get up anymore. Like the, like everybody else, you don't have to punch that clock. <laughs> oh. You do not have that steady job you used to have. You have that pension. Well, I'm here to tell you, you thought you'd be cruising around the world in an RV or going fishing somewhere? Well, I got news for you. Your work's not over yet. And I know for some of us, they always got work to do. I ain't gonna say no names. But we all still have work to do. Because see, as a Christian, you got more work to do. You got a second job. Your work is not done. You got a second job. You're ready to roll. And even though, yes, you put in time on the job, you may put in 20 years or 30 years or 40 years, and now you can finally kick your feet off and relax, but you can't. There's still work to be done. And I think if you ask a lot of retirees, they're working more now than when they were working. Well, some of us maybe, some of us maybe not. But I'm here to tell you this much. You should be working harder. You build up your wealth for home. Now it's time to build up Christ's kingdom. That work does not stop. There is plenty of work to do. There are plenty of fields to be cut. There are plenty of fruit to be picked off the tree. There is plenty of new roads to build. There are plenty of new buildings to be built. There is plenty of things to be done. You've got a second job. And for some of us, this could be a third job. But you have a job to do. Your job is not done. So as he pulls these fishermen out who dealt with adversity in their job to feed their families, you have the adversity of stepping out of your comfort zone and doing something different. You have the ability to step up and step out and show that, yes, God is still using me. And there's always one thing I say about being used by God is, God, do I have the ability? God, do I have this? God, do I have that? I can give you a hint to let you know if you can help build a kingdom. One question. Are you breathing? If you're breathing, you can go to work. If you're breathing, you, are, you need to get busy. So we're dealing with these men here that Jesus called up to help build his kingdom. He chose men who can face adversity. But he also chose men who were willing. What did they do? Jesus said, come follow me. And they dropped what they were doing. And they followed. Now with some of y'all, you call your wife or husband in the room, they don't come right away, do they? You hear a question, what? Why? What did I do now? <laughs> what do you want? <laughs> Amen. But notice, notice what these men did. They dropped everything. They dropped everything and went because they heard the call of the master. What are you willing to drop today to get work done tomorrow? What are you willing to drop today to start work today? Today. Not tomorrow, today. Christ knows what you can do. Now, if you look back into the disciples like Peter and Paul, um, well, actually Peter, not Paul, but Peter was very, was the rock that Jesus built his, his church on. But also, Peter was very powerful. And he was so well regarded. 
that if you look in Acts, I believe it's chapter 5, people used to put their sick and injured in the street. So maybe Peter's shadow would touch them and they'll be healed. <coughs> now, it doesn't say in the Bible if that really did happen, but that's what they did. That's the thought process they had in their mind. This man is so powerful with God. He is so tight with God. He is so in tune. I want to be in his shadow and maybe I could be healed. Now, Paul, Paul was not a disciple at the time. He became one later on, he became a follower of Christ. He was so powerful that people used to take his napkins that he used to wipe his mouth and heal themselves. It's powerful. That's the power these men had. Because if you think of his job description, you're going to be taught, you're going to be given some power, and you're going to be persecuted. And that's what happened to him. You're going to be taught, you'll have some power, you're going to be persecuted. Why should I do that kind of job? Why do I want to be there for that? Because there's glory at the end of the road. There is glory at the end of the road. Because see, do you want to go to heaven and say, well, Lord, I, I went to church once a month. I, I put $10 in the plate. And I say a prayer once in a while. Or do you want to say to God, Lord, you know what I've done. And he can see your work. See how you help bring people to Christ. See how you lived a godly life. See how you went and helped others. See how you were humble. See how you prayed for others. See how he were fishing for men. And he can look at you and say, well done. Well done. My good and faithful servant. Right from there, we can learn this, is that if you're doing the work of Christ, you cannot fail. You may not get the numbers that somebody else has, or they may not get your numbers. Don't worry about that. You get your numbers. Do what God's given you to do. Because God equips all of us. He took fishermen who were just fishing around, trying to feed their families, and he turned them into disciples. He took people who were blind, people who were prostitutes, people who were infirm, injured, blind, bleeding, sick, even took somebody who was dead. Took someone who was dead and worked through him. Y'all ain't dead yet. Y'all still alive. So that means y'all have some more work to do. There is no more excuses, no more saying I can't do this, no more saying I can't do that. Because if you think about it, if you don't want to do something, you'll find an excuse very easily. And some of us find excuses constantly, every day of our lives of not to do something. We procrastinate. And that is something we need to stop doing. We cannot procrastinate anymore. We look how what Jesus took and made into men who are worthy to be read about, understood, talked about, and discussed, and to share. And these are ordinary men, not great men, not men of great speech, not men of great learning. They're just regular, good, regular dudes. And he took them and used them. He even took a tax collector. And even back then, tax collectors were not a well-regarded position, and you see some things never change. That's my love for the IRS. But anyway. <laughs> but he took them and he used them for his purpose, for his glory. So my message to you is simply this. God has a purpose for you. Sometimes you may not know exactly what it is. Sometimes you need to pray on it. Sometimes you need to ask somebody else. But God is constantly showing us hints. He is constantly there nudging us in the right direction. You may be thinking you're doing something now, but God has something more in store for you. Something big in store for you. So if you are retired, there is more in store for you. If you are working, there is more in store for you. If you're going to college, there's more in store for you. 
if you're a teaching school, there's more in store for you. A lot of times they say, well, you can't preach on the job. You, if you proselytize on the job, you can be fired, this and that. Well, that's true. But like St. Francis C. said, go to the world and preach all the nations. Tell the good news. And if you have to, use words. Use your actions. Let your actions show who you are. Not the world tells you who you are. Let your actions show who you are. Because you're going to get beat down. And if you've been married for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, there's been some times that in, in a marriage you got beat down. And not by inside forces, but outside forces. And sometimes by in-laws, and some of them you could call outlaws. We deal with that. We have to fight through that. But we have to remain consistent and know who the true master is. And the true master is Jesus. So I'm going to give you three simple points here to think about. There's, there's three points to take away. And the first one's an easy one, is that you have a job. And in 2 Timothy 1.19, he saves us and calls us to a holy life, not because of anything we have done, but because of his own purpose and grace. And this grace was given us in Christ, in Christ is before the beginning of time. You have a job, and you have been called. Each one of us has been called. We heard the good news, we understood the good news, and we have been called. Second point is this, you have skills. God gives each and every one of us certain skills and abilities. Your skills are not like somebody else's skills. Now, I wish I could sing. I cannot. I accepted it. I learned that at a very young age. I think I was six. My mother's singing to me, and I started singing back, and she left me in the room. <laughs> she came back next Thursday. <laughs> but you have skills. You look at the skills the disciples had, and maybe you may not get to that point, but you look at the skills that they had, but they could go and heal people. God has given each one of us certain skills and abilities, some better than others. And what we have to do is find out what those skills are. And you find that out by praying. You find that out by looking. You find that out by asking. Because your ministry is out there, and there's ministries for everyone. Your ministry is out there. You are being called to a ministry. And you have skills to give to that ministry. And the third point is this, and this is the most important point. He sends us a helper. We are not alone. Right now you have your church family, you have your family, but you also have the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit gives us power. And the Holy Spirit makes things clear. The Holy Spirit shows us what the truth is, what lies are, what's good, and what's best for us. Yes. You are not alone in this battle. Because a lot of times when we think we're alone, we get discouraged. You're not alone. You're never alone. Look to the left of the church. Look to the right of the church. You are not alone. Even for the numbers in here right now, this is roughly triple what Jesus had with his told disciples. You're not alone. You have someone to talk to, someone to share with, someone to ask a question of. And I know some of us are a little tighter than others, but still, you have someone to help you in your ministry, in your mission, in your job. So you have a second job, and your second job is to help bring others to Christ. Yes. Yes. Amen? Amen. Amen? Amen. Let us stand as we open the doors of the church. And if you're out of church home, I invite you now to step forward. Give me your hand and give God your heart. All right. It is that time. Stop being on the sidelines. It's time to get in the game. 
Get off the unemployment line. Get on the employment line. You have a second job. You are not unemployed. You can't be used for the greatness of God. You can't be used to glorify his kingdom. You can't be used to make a difference in this world. So as the praise team sings, the doors of the church are open.